great, great testimony and a great understanding. Amen. Some of, some of us realize that you ain't doing nothing until the enemy comes at you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know, when when life is doing good and God is, is blessing you, that's when the enemy really likes to act up. But how many know, how many know that God is there? Yes. Yes. And God is still in control. Yes. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but this has been a crazy week for me. Amen. One one obstacle, one burden, one hardship after another. But oh, give me Jesus. Yes. Give me Jesus. You know, Scripture reminds us, the Scripture for today, but our God searched the heart and examined the mind. I get to the heart of the human. God says, I get to the root of things. And then God says, I treat them as they really are. Really are. Not as they pretend to be. Let us pray, dear God, this prayer word. As we gather to God this Black History Month, just bring a word. Say something, God, to, to our condition. Where we are right now, dear God, and what we have overcome yeah. and what we're still overcoming. Yes. God, say a word so that we might live better according to thy plan and purpose. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to serve a congregation and to be able to preach in the pulpit and tell the real black history which is an African story of Africans in America, their progress and their struggle. Yes. You see, the black narrative is not often told in the schoolhouse any longer. Not often told even in the community. We, we get a snippet every once in a while on TV shows and in the news, but really when you ask that old Keeps my hill turn, Harari Gandhi, what's going on? Very few people really tell the truth about what's going on in our community. So thanks be to God, we got scripture to remind us that our history is just but a part of history, but it's good news. Amen. I would like to suggest today that the book of Jeremiah sets up a dichotomy between how to approach your living and your history as we go through life and we go through those things that make us prosper. The, the book of Jeremiah is often associated as a book of, of idolatry and, and prophecy that, that, that really just rounds up on how do people deal with, with no longer following and directing themselves to God. But, but I challenge you that also in the book of Jeremiah, is a push for freedom and liberation. A push to understand that God can restore you, even as our scripture said today, to a place where your roots can be anchored in Eden. The Garden of Eden, with, with all that goodness that was there. If, if you just trust in God, you can go all the way back. And, and some of us recognize that the Garden of Eden was in Africa. And we're proud of that. And we celebrate that. The, the book of Jeremiah is primarily concerned, though, with justice. And, it, it, and, and how the rulers exercise that justice and how they do for all. But it deals with wealth. But I think a lot of times we don't even talk about wealth in the black church. Not like we should. I am so glad and happy that now we have seminarians and, and clergy people coming in who are powerfully beginning to connect poverty and the black church and say that the church can be more than just a singing board. Right. But we can launch businesses and entrepreneurships and we can, launch, launch, we can reach into the community and, and, and grow from what we used to be to what we need to be. Hello? Yeah. See, Jeremiah is a book about, about justice, but it's also about the protection of the weaker members of society. 
from oppression from the most powerful. Move number one, uh, and, and I'll go ahead and warn you all today, there's five moves, not three, but God was busy this week. Number one, while the book of Jeremiah primus, promises to place the priority for justice on the side of the king, Jeremiah does something very unique and interesting because what the prophet really does is he says it's not just the king that's causing us misery. What Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah does, if you look at the opening of the book, it really, really, you know, Jeremiah goes out and he said, I'm going to go out and find one man that's doing right. God tells him, to say, if you can find one that's doing justice to others, you'll be all right. So, so Jeremiah goes out and he's searching and he's seeking to find one that's doing justice, to find one that's leading right, to find one that's doing right. He went up first and he looked amongst the rich. He said, there got to be one rich person that's doing well and doing just to everybody. He didn't find one. So he said, okay, 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 okay. God, I'm going to go back. I know that those that are oppressed are poor. There's got to be one amongst the poor that's doing right, that's living just, that's serving others. He didn't find one amongst the poor either. So Jeremiah puts forth the word. He says, look, the rich and the poor got a problem with oppression. I don't think you heard me. He said, the rich and the poor got a problem with greed. The rich and the poor got a problem with selfishness. Jeremiah was saying, I can't find nobody that has goodwill towards others. Now, 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 Jeremiah was looking because if he could find one, God was going to spare the judgment. So judgment falls. And in chapter 17, the Babylonians are coming to wreak havoc on Judah and Jerusalem. But many ask, them, where did these Babylonians come from? Why would God make these mean-spirited angry Babylonians to come into our nice warm community and destroy and destroy us. Why would God do that? You know? Why does God make the, 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 the Ku Klux Klans of the world? Why does God make folk that are, 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 are proud boys? What, what, what is God doing with that? Why does God develop angry nations? Why is there all this spark and, and, and God doesn't do that. God just uses the Babylonians you create. Right. Hello? The stuff you create by your practices and you're not attending to the oppressed and you're not living right, you build up that stuff. You created the Babylonians. You created the enemies. And God just lets those enemies that you've already created because you're not living right come upon you. You've got to get that. Because many of us are walking around here talking about the white supremacists and the Christian nationalists. But maybe we're part and parcel responsible for creating these groups. Because we hadn't been the church that we were supposed to be. We hadn't lived like we were supposed to be. We hadn't followed God like we were supposed. We hadn't taught our children like we were supposed. We hadn't spoke up as a church and a community when we were supposed to. We allowed the world to silence us and tell us about our God when we knew God ever since the beginning. And we should have been yelling, our God is a good God and he lived to reign over us. Maybe we caused the Babylonians. Maybe our actions are multiplying them. 
and causing them to grow even more. So it's point number two. We may have caused the Babylonians. Point number three. We're in all this history. You, you hear me? We celebrate Black History Month, but we're in all this history. And Black History Month encompasses, as Sister McLaren just said, the greatest and the most creative. But Black History Month also encompasses our failures and our mistakes. You see, you can't get just the good. Hello, Black History Month. You can't just get just good to just the good. You got to get the good as well as the bad. And all that is part of our history. Because yes, we have been under, and yes, we have been oppressed, and yes, we have gone through some stuff, and yes, we have gone through Jim Crow, and yes, we have gone through segregation, and yes, we have found ourselves at times under the foot of the American system, but you need to understand that at times we have also contributed, we've been good when we were rich, and we've been good when we were poor. But we've been bad when we were rich, and we've been bad when we were poor. Jeremiah is saying both the oppressed and the oppressor have caused this situation. Mm. <laughs> Hello? And see, Black History Month, we can't just celebrate who made the peanut and who created the light bulb and not deal with the fact that we worked so hard that oftentimes we didn't come home to our own children. Mm -hmm. We can't just deal with the fact of, of who developed the straightening cone mm -hmm. and who allowed, became the first African American female millionaire, or right now who in the White House signs the, the treasury notes, mm -hmm. and not deal with the fact that we as black churches, many of us no longer have after school programs. No longer have weekend or Saturday school. No longer, no longer invite the children even in to celebrate and learn and grow. We, we failed as well as the oppressor. Yes, the oppressor has mistreated us, but we have also mistreated ourselves. Jeremiah was saying. Rule number four. I keep going. I keep going. Let me see if I can modernize this point. And make it make it relevant for right now. We must abandon the notion that white people lose when black people succeed. Now, where did I get that? I got that from a sister named Heather McGee, Dr. Heather McGee. She says eventually she had to realize that many of the problems in this country, from decaying infrastructure to inadequate health care stems from the false notion that successful people of color are at the expense of white folk. Wait, what are you saying, Brad? Say the same thing Jeremiah was saying. You know, God is not taking away from the rich to make the poor. You see, you see, we've set up this thing. If one group succeeds, somebody got to be pulled down. That's, that's, not, that's not necessarily true. That's not true. We can all move together. That's what King was saying time and time again when he spoke of the beloved community. We can all come up together. It's not about white versus black. That's when we got caught up. You can't get caught up in that. You got to understand that God is a blessing God and God through Jesus said there's an abundance for everybody and everybody can have their part and we got to stop saying God is limited. So if he does for me, he can't do for nobody else because what that sets up is even in the midst of Wesley. We start working against each other. Because we say, sister so-and-so can't get up. Because if she gets up, I got to come down. No! We can all do. Oh, no, who taught us that some win and the others lose? We can all win together. We can all move together. We can all live together. You know, you know, I love this sister. She says, she says she, she's got proof. She said, it's been rough, but we can't fall into the hidden cost of racism. 
The truth is that supporting racism and white and black economic divide has cost this country almost $16 trillion in the last 20 years. Wow. In her book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everybody, How We Can Prosper Together, Heather McGee details how during desegregation communities often opted to close public schools, public pools, in, a, in order to keep them integrated. What you saying, Red? Folk would have a pool, nice Caucasian pool, would have a pool. And when the law was changed, they said you couldn't have a public place and not invite everybody. They would rather pour semen in the pool than let everybody swim. Now, now, now what they missed was, if you got a pool, and you go swim in the pool, and you put concrete in the pool, you can't swim in that pool no more. Hello? But yet, they would rather close the pool than let my children swim in. Hello, King Street. You know? Hello, Lexi. Public pools. Closed. We thank God that some are working to restore even those public pools back to us. Hello, somebody. But we got to learn that you don't, how, how, y'all know how grandma used to say, right? You don't cut off your nose. Despite your face. Despite your face. Amen. You know? We've got to learn to develop policies amongst ourselves that do not kill ourselves. Churches! Closing the church in the afternoon because the insurance go up. We can't afford to have this program because we got to pay insurance. So what? The community needs it. The children need it. Amen. The schools can't do everything on their own. And I am so tired of grandmas in their great grandma age having to babysit and keep children because the young people won't step up and there's no place for after school and they out working and the children all over them. I, 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 I really think we should have a program to take care of the children so I can get the old people back in Bible study where they belong. selfish, but, but I'm tired of being worn out. You know, they come to Bible school with six kids, and they walk in there, and the whole Bible study class, not because the preacher is born, but because they're tired, they sleep. Maybe. You see, Jeremiah was saying that greed, unbridled pursuit of economic gain is not how God works. Walter Brueggemann said, all persons, but especially religious leaders, are indicted for their unprincipled economics. Do you hear me? No, I don't think that. Let me break that down. Unprincipled economics. That's when we throwing money out there without a moral budget, without a moral understanding. Just throwing it around. You know, let me give you a couple million dollars for your election campaign or your coffers fund because it's just money. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Churches getting caught up because they want to use money wrong ways and get money and find money. You know, people are sick of it. People are sick of the church. Money this, money that, money this, money that. Hello? <laughs> you know? Let's keep it real. But the problem is the church is having to pick up a responsibility for the community because neither the government nor the schools nor nobody else is doing what they need to do on bridal economics. That's what Heaven McGee was talking about. The balance. Where is it? In our community, are all the rich not doing right and all the poor not doing right? You know, somebody challenged me. With really? The people got the stimulus money. 
and they bought TVs and, and drugs and, and fixed up their cars. So what? So what? It was, it was $1,500. You know, I done, had, I done had years where I done spent almost $1,500 on stuff coming out of my um, bank account because I forgot to cancel a subscription. Oh, don't y'all look at me like that. Y'all do the same thing. Don't, don't even look up here and say, oh, Rev, shame on you. Y'all know y'all got some bills on your car. You don't know what they are, but you don't feel like calling a canceler. <laughs> Unprincipled economics. Hello, can I, can I go home? Six million dollar commercials for the Super Bowl game? Hello? I mean, I like the game just as much as the next person, but I remember growing up, all we did was drive down a dirt road to a baseball field and <laughs> stood up at a fence and watched the game, and they had no commercials. <laughs> Hello? Hello? $100 cards for Valentine's Day? Unprincipled! Jeremiah was saying, you spend your money, you waste your money, you waste your economy on things that do not prosper, those that are hurting, those in need, those that need help, you take your money and you throw it away. As the McGee was saying, you spend money on things that hurt yourself. Hmm. My God. She said if the economy was right, we would spend money on health care. If the economy was right, we would spend money on community development. If the economy was right, we would spend money on, 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 on education. If the economy was right, we would spend money on roads. She had another point in her book. She said, folk, during the time of slavery, would spend all the money on the plantation and not spend money on the roads or the earth roads going to and from and couldn't get off that plantation because they hadn't fixed the roads. Hello, Deep River. Why every week we got a new hole in the road? Hello? I mean, you know, you can't walk out the church without falling in another pit. Come on, See, that's what McGee was saying. That, that's what Jeremiah was saying. See, I know. Y'all wondering, too. Well, Rev, how is this black history? Glad you asked. Because I'm moving. Move number five. I told you I had five. Since the exception, Black History Month has never been about just celebrating black Americans and their achievement story. It's been part ever since Carter G. Woodson pinned the phrase Black History Month and Black History Week. Part of black history has really been involved in about making a change in the policy. When Wilson developed black history, y'all gotta get this, because a lot of us have learned in the last few years that, that Carter G. Wilson started black history, but we still don't know why he started it. He started black history so that folk would see that the Africans and the African Americans and the black folk were a part of history, that they had contributed to what we were living in right now. He wanted the world to know. That we were not left out. Yeah. Right. And that we were not nobodies. Right. But he pushed it further. That policy would change. Yeah. That's what we miss. Yeah. We celebrate all this black history stuff, but we ain't changed much policy. Mm. Yeah. We got policy, mm. but it hadn't made no difference. Yeah. Jeremiah said they had rules and legislation, but it made no difference. He said, you can't trust man to do on his own without a dependency upon God. So church, the battle is still on. And what we got to do is we got to appreciate our history. But we also got to change policy. Remember that Black History Month exists to deliver what federal policy could not do. And you got to understand that unless you change the policy, there's not going to be change. Let me show you, and I'll end on this. You see, we got policy. We got Brown versus Board, yet racial segregation still exists in our schools. 
We got policy. We got the Fair Housing Act. Yet racial segregation is still all through housing, and you can't even find a house for the pastor in Lake City. Hello, somebody. We, we, we have policy, but it ain't real. We have the 15th Amendment, and yet the Supreme Court weakened voter rights. We have policy. Yet black unemployment is still nearly 10 times, and black wealth. It's still a fraction of what white wealth is in our community. See, we got policy. But black health is nearly unexistent in a lot of our communities. Heart disease and asthma and infant mortality and diabetes. My Lord, diabetes. And some folks don't even deal with the fact that racially thinking we triple the number of patients with cancer than other communities. You see, church, we got policy. But policy without implementation, policy without community involvement, policy without activism. I, I hear y'all struggling. Here's the glue. Here's the glue right here. Jeremiah found folk with wealth and found folk with power. He found folk without wealth and without power. But none of them were doing the work of the Lord. Amen. And don't sit down on your haunches. Can I say haunches in church? <laughs> don't, don't sit down on your haunches and wait for somebody else to make right with the Lord, what you need to make right. All right. Amen. All right. Don't point your finger and say they didn't do All right. when you hadn't done. Because right. the scripture says Jeremiah looked for one mm -hmm. and couldn't find one amongst mm -hmm. the officers, mm -hmm. the clergy, the lay, the wealthy. Couldn't find one serving the greater good. Wesley, happy Black History Month. Now go change it. Thanks for your time. In our prayer of peace, may today there be peace within. May you trust God that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use these gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be confident knowing you are a child of God. Let this present 